Let me in John chapter one, verse 35. Before we get too far, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for your church. Jesus, thank you for drawing us into relationship with you. And wherever we are in our, our discipleship journey, Jesus, thank you for meeting us there. Thank you for not making us have all the answers before we are worth uh, having as followers. But thank you for accepting us in our questions, in our doubts, in our misunderstandings, all of that, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for calling us to be your disciples. And Father, for those who are not yet your disciples, Jesus, for the people who have not yet said yes to the grace that you offer, I just ask that your spirit would soften their hearts and they would see that there is room in the family of God for them and that they are welcome here at Creekside and we would love to help them continue to grow in their faith and to say yes to you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Spirit. Amen. 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 Let's look at John chapter one, verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. I love that last part. It was about four o'clock. That's important. Anyway. Um, so last week, we talked about how John served all of his life to point people to the Messiah. That was his job, to get ready, to get people ready for Jesus. And so when Jesus comes, he baptized Jesus. And the next day, this is where that story picks up. The next day, Jesus is walking by and John says, look, the Lamb of God. And two of his followers just get up and start following Jesus. John is a great example, I think, of humility uh, as a Christian leader uh, for us today. Because as a pastor, I've seen many people come and go at Creekside. And it's hard when people leave because you build relationships with these people and you, you like them. And I'm not telling that to you so that you feel like, well, I can never leave because it hurts Jason's feelings. All right, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> but it, it's hard when people go. But here we see John who... His whole life is to help people get ready for Jesus. And when Jesus comes, he just points and his, his followers leave. They follow Jesus. And so our first category of disciples is this, disciples who transfer. If you're following along, that's point one, disciples who transfer. Because John could have been like, hey, look, the Lamb of God, like, isn't that great what he's doing over there? But you guys stay here, stay with me. But he never does that. He never does that. He just lets them go follow Jesus. He lets them go where Jesus is going because his whole life, last week we talked about his, his identity, his calling, his activity all orbit around Jesus. So when Jesus is doing something, he's willing to let his, his own followers follow Jesus and the two disciples go. Here's the great thing about following Jesus. Jesus knows the next level you need to go to. Now, as we look at today and we think about like churches, I know I am not John the baptizer and you know, that, that's not my role in this world. And my role though is like John, just to point people to Jesus. And if people come to Creekside because they are following Jesus and they wanna be on mission with Jesus and they came from another church, awesome. If people someday need to leave Creekside because Jesus is leading them to another place, I need to also be awesome with that which is a weird way to say that, but I need to say, good, follow Jesus. Very rarely do you say, yeah, you know, I think you would be better at this other church with that other pastor. I think that's where Jesus, leads. very rarely do pastors actually say that. But I need to be willing to say, Jesus, these are your people. This is your church. You are going to bring and you're going to release people because you know where they need to go. You, need, you know where they need to, to step up in their next game. Now, if you are here and you transferred from another church, I am so glad you're here, but I have some questions to ask. Did you come to Creekside because you just wanted to get your needs met? Which means like, you know, you wanted better music or you wanted a pastor with a higher joke ratio in his sermon. 
or, you, or lower, you know, when, when I'm speaking. Uh, thank you, Darius. Set that up. Perfect. Darius knows about lower joke ratio this morning, right? Uh, or maybe it's like, you know, we just need a place where the kids, you know, I can drop them off and they can be raised to be Christians there. And you, you have all these things that are needs that you want. If that's your heart and you came to Creekside to get your needs met, I'm going to challenge you because we're going to ask you to do some things that are make, going to make you uncomfortable. We're going to ask you to do some things that will ha- take your, your eyes off of your own needs and look to the needs of others. We're going to ask you to join a ministry team to, to serve, to help move the mission of the, of the gospel forward here. And ministry teams are parts of that mission. People who greet at the front door, people who run the lights and the media, people working with the kids, with the youth, people coming in throughout the week, all of that, those are all teams that help move the mission forward. We're gonna ask you to do that. We're gonna ask you to serve your neighbor and love them because that's what Jesus would want you to do. We're gonna ask you to, to give, not because we need your money, but because we need the resources to move the mission forward. And when we give, that's what we're giving to, to move the mission forward. We're gonna ask you to be in a group because there are no Lone Ranger Christians. There are no people who can just say, you know, it's just me and Jesus and we'll be fine. No, you're not fine. You need to be in a group. When we talk about groups on Sundays and these group promotion months, it's not just because we want people to be busy throughout the week. It's because we know that we do not grow well alone. We need other people. We are wired to be in community. And so we challenge you to be in groups so that you can grow together with other believers. We challenge you to host a group so that you can meet other group people's needs. We challenge you to lead a group, not for you, but for other people. At Creekside, we are so focused on the mission that God has called us to, that we are constantly saying, church is not for me, it's for people who don't know Jesus yet. And so we're gonna challenge you to take your eyes off of yourself and your needs to help meet the needs of others. So if you transferred here, welcome. But if you know those things are gonna make you uncomfortable, then maybe Jesus isn't leading you here. But if you're willing to be challenged, if you're willing to grow, if you're willing to do what Jesus is calling you to do, we would love to have you here. Because Jesus has a calling for all of us and we all get to help point people to Jesus. About a year and a half ago, uh, I, we had a couple who transferred here from another church and um, their names are Mike and Donna and they're awesome. And uh, they wanted to meet with me because they're really passionate about missions. And I get really nervous when people want to meet with me, because I oversee missions, and when people just want to meet with me, that's, I don't know what's happening. Um, me? I'm not that great. Um, but they, sometimes people want to meet with me because they want to give me assignments to help meet their needs, um, which, it's like, wait a minute, that's, uh, what? Um, so I was really nervous about this meeting, and uh, we met, and they just said, Jason, we've been leading teams to Mexico for years, and we feel like Jesus was leading us out of our our, our church and led us to Creekside, and we would love to continue to, to lead these trips with Creekside. And we would love to just partner with you and do whatever we can to help move the mission forward at Creekside. Those are the best kinds of meetings. Because you leave those meetings, it's like, hey, I didn't get more work. <laughs> and here's the people who want to make the work of the gospel go forward. And they just wanted like, to say, like, I'm not competing with you. I'm not trying to draw anything. I want to work with you. They transferred, and they're just doing what Jesus called them to do. That's awesome. What are the things that God's calling you to do? What are the things that God is saying, like, I need you to do this? Maybe it's a ministry team. Maybe it's something that we don't even know yet, but you know God is calling you to do it, and you just maybe need some help formulating how that's going to work, but you know God's calling you to do it. Let us know. And especially if you've just transferred here, and you're passionate about something, and you want to put some skin in the game and get to work, we'd love to meet with you. I would meet with you. But if you were coming and say, Jason, I have all these needs, I will probably not want to really schedule that meeting. Can we just do this over email? I'll send you a Facebook message because I check that never at times. Um, (laughs) But we are here 
to do what Jesus called us to. He knows the next level he's leading you to and we're here to do what he is calling us to do. The next, uh, let's look at the next chunk, verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The second category here is disciples who are brought. It requires somebody to bring them, but let's talk about those disciples who are brought. Somewhere along the line, somebody told you about Jesus. Somebody told you the story in their life, what happened, or somebody walked you through some, some part of the Bible or helped answer some questions that you had, and they brought you to a church. Maybe they brought you to Creekside, and you were brought here. And for disciples who are brought, one of the really cool things that Jesus does, and I think I'm out of order here. Let, yep, yeah, I'm out of order. Please forgive me. For people who are bringing disciples, people who do not know Jesus yet, here's the great thing. Jesus knows your network. It's not an accident that you know the people you know, that you work with the people you work with. Jesus knows the people in your life, and he knows who needs Jesus. He knows who needs grace, and here's how he knows. Everybody Everybody needs Jesus and he knows the people in your life and he knows the struggles. And if we trust Jesus and say, and ask the spirit of God to say, you know what, give me wisdom to speak into my friend's life, he answers those prayers. And so here's uh, Andrew, who the first thing he does is goes and finds his brother. Andrew did not wait to have all the answers to all his questions about this, this Jesus guy. He just said, Simon, we found the Messiah, come follow me. Jesus knows your network. And for the people who are, who are brought, Jesus knows who you're going to be. He knows who you will be. And I love this because as soon as he sees Simon, he says, your name is Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas. Now, this is weird, right? Because he didn't know Simon, son of John. Did Jesus have a, a prophetic moment here with Simon? And I love how he did this because he basically gave Simon a nickname. You'll be called Cephas. You'll be called Rocky. <laughs> my, uh, my dad always wanted me to name my kids weird names like Rex or Rocky. So when I read this story, it's like, oh, dad, you're, you're adorable. Um, <laughs> but... He's basically, you will be called Rocky. I'm just gonna call you Rocky. And it's not just because he wanted to have a nickname for his buddy. But think about the life of Peter. How Peter rose up to become this leader in the church. This strong character who was a complete knucklehead for three years. But when, when, when the time came, he rose up and he led. Jesus knew that, he saw that. He knew who Simon would be and he started calling him Peter. Jesus knows who you will be. If you are new to faith and you're like, I don't know who I am, I don't know what's going on, can I just share with you a few ways that we figure out who we are called to be? Because Jesus has a calling for every one of our lives. The first way is through prayer. And prayer is not just going to God with a shopping list and saying, Jesus, I need these things. Peace out. Amen. Prayer, true prayer, where you're seeking to know God is coming and just spending time with God. And for some, it's like, I got 30 seconds, I can focus on this, and, and you grow over time. For other people, you, you're able to spend longer times in prayer, but are you praying and giving God your list, or are you seeking God? Because if you're seeking God, you will find out more about yourself, because God will reveal to you who he's called you to be. The second way we do this is through, uh, through scripture. And you're like, but I'm not in this book. Right, but you can find God's plan for your life, how he called you to tell people about Jesus, all of those things. You can find that as you read scripture and scripture will come alive to you if you let it speak to you and you will be able to identify who you are. The other way, another way is through serving. 
like I said, join a ministry team. Like if you find, if you get involved in serving here in Creekside or in your community, you will find something that you are passionate about. And if you start somewhere and you like, man, this is not working for me, go do something else, but continually be serving to find where God has wired you. There's a great quote by a guy named uh, Frederick Buechner. He says, your calling is where your joy and the world's deep hunger meet. There's a need that God knows you can meet and that will bring you joy. But you gotta serve to find that. And then the fourth way is community. Do you allow other people to speak into your life to, to say, you know what, I see God doing this in you. I see God shaping you this way. Maybe God is calling you into this area. So prayer, scripture, serving, community, those are all things that, the great thing about that is they, they take our eyes off of ourself and focus on what God wants and what the world needs. That's all part of following Jesus. And so Peter was brought Jesus knew who he would be. And so today, if you are here and somebody brought you here, maybe you're here for the first time, Jesus knows who you are. He knows the future that he has for you. Will you respond to that? And will you begin that journey with Jesus? Let's look at the next category. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. So Philip, just hanging out. One day, Jesus walks along and just says, follow me. And Philip just does. Just no questions. <laughs> just, oh, okay. This third category is the disciples who respond. For some people, they found Jesus because they were just driving by a church one day and just pulled in because there was cars there. They didn't have any relationship with anybody who was a Christian. They just showed up. Creekside, there are people here every week who are not brought here by a friend, but they're brought here by the drawing, the drawing of the Spirit of God. So the challenge for us, if you are a regular Creekside person, regular, you're here all the time, is to have your own eyes and your heart open to, to seek out people because you don't know, maybe you are the one who will be that relational bridge to help them come closer to Jesus. So if you see somebody you don't recognize, be nice. Don't freak them out. <laughs> don't like say, hey, you're new. Join my group right now. Say, hi, my name is. Let's start there. Build relationships. Welcome people because there are people who are just responding to what God is doing in their life and they don't have any vocabulary to express what that is. They don't know anybody here and they need Jesus, just like you need Jesus. And if that's you today, I would love to hear how God drew you here. We hear stories of this often in, in the Muslim world where, where the spirit of God will actually send somebody a dream and in, and in the dream, they'll see Jesus and Jesus will say something like, go here and you'll meet a Christian. And we hear these stories and it's like, oh, that seems weird. But God is weird. Is that all right? To let God do whatever God's gonna do and just say, you know what, God, if you are drawing people to you, awesome. As a follower of Jesus, I need to be ready to help those who are responding to what the spirit of God is doing. So if that's you today, maybe you, you're just a disciple like Philip who just responded and said, you know what, I'm just gonna follow Jesus. You are ready for an incredible adventure. And I wanna challenge you today to, to, not, to not just like, I don't know, I, I'm scared and, and leave, but to stick around, to hang out here at Creekside for, for a while and ask your questions and, and seek answers. And we're not gonna have all the answers, but we're gonna help you process this. And if you're saying yes to Jesus for the first time, can I, can I just tell you, Jesus died for you. We celebrated that in communion. It is the greatest thing that has ever happened, that Jesus loved you enough to come and die for you so that you could have a relationship with God. And today is the best day to say yes to Jesus. And can you write on the back of your card, there's a little field that says, become a follower of Jesus. We would love to know if that's you today. So there's the disciples who respond. 
And the, the sub point here is that Jesus knows where you are. He knows where you are. And he's drawing you to him. Let's keep going. The last category. The next, uh, wait, 45. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and, the, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. So Philip, like Andrew, didn't have all the questions to all answer. Didn't, he just went and found Nathaniel and said, Nathaniel, come, we found the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for, the, the prophets, Moses, they all are talking about this guy. It's Jesus. He's from Nazareth. And I love Nathaniel's response. Can anything good come from there? Right? It's like, he's from North Everett. Can anything good come from North Everett? <laughs> Not really. And I love, I love Philip's response. He didn't sit down and say, yes, here are the reasons from scripture why he had to come to Nazareth. No. What did he say? He just said, come and see. It was an invitation. This fourth category is disciples who doubt. Disciples who doubt. Now we have all doubted from time to time. I'm a pastor and I doubt. And uh, here's the great thing about Jesus though. He gives me just enough faith to keep following him. This week I had to visit somebody in the hospital and they're not doing well and they probably won't ever come out of the hospital. And you, in those situations, it's really easy to say, God, how could you do this? Why is this happening to my friend? And you have those moments of doubt. Is it okay for a pastor to have moments of doubt? I would hope so, because I want to be honest with you. I used to be afraid of doubt, because I used to think Jesus was afraid of doubt. Like, if I doubted, like, somehow Jesus would be like, oh, now I don't know what to do. When I, was, I, I went to a Bible school, I have a Bible degree and a theology degree, and when I was in Bible school, if I expressed any kind of doubt in certain circles with certain students, they would just pounce on you, and so it really hammered down, like, you just keep your doubts to yourself. Just plow ahead and just do the paper. But it wasn't until ministry and, and, and several experiences of failure where you realize, you know what? I can't do this by myself. And in the moments of doubt, my only hope is Jesus. Man, that's a relief. To put all your doubt to say, Jesus, I don't know what to do here with this. And Nathaniel doubted. And his doubt was, can anything good come from Nazareth? But he still doubted. And Jesus, his response he says, I saw you under the fig tree while you were still, you know, when Philip came and found you. Did, is Jesus saying, like, I saw Philip over there talking to you and I could see you and I was like, I bet his name's Nathaniel. Or was Jesus saying, I had a vision of you under a tree? Was this a moment of the divine coming through Jesus where, and Nathaniel saying, whoa, there's no way you should know that. Jesus gives us just enough faith to take the next step. I've shared this story uh, before, but I, I find it helpful in moments of doubt. I trained for a half marathon years ago, and I survived. So, yes, bucket list checked off. Um, I never want to do that again. When I started, I had no real belief in myself that I could finish 13.1 miles. And I, did, I just didn't know how I would do that. And every day I, when I trained, I had to go outside to run. And I live on the end of a cul-de-sac at the bottom of a hill. So I've only got up, which is, I don't know if you know this about running, that's the hardest part, <laughs> up. So every day I had to go up. 
and started training. It was hard and it was difficult. And I just had, like, I just was like, you know what? I can do one more step. I can do one more step. That next step isn't going to kill me. I can do one more step. And when I actually came to race day, I was like, oh man, I was, I, the longest I'd ran was 11 miles. And I was like, okay, I think I can live through this. And that'll be great because I love my kids and I want to see them. I don't want them to say, yeah, daddy died in a horrible running accident <laughs> where he just, like, he exploded and melted on the road. It's weird. <laughs> Felt like it. But I'm running, just running, doing my thing. And I, one of the funniest things on that whole experience was there was a banner. There's these t- different tables, and there's a banner that was sponsored by the uh, Atheist Society of Seattle, which is a horrible acronym. Somebody should seriously talk to them about that. <laughs> but, and they had a banner that said, we believe in you. And I was amazed because I was like, you went from believing in nothing to believing in me. Because right now, like, I don't really think, I'm, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'm really here right now. I'm, I, I don't know. I'm like Descartes. I'm taking the whole universe apart and I got to build it back up. One step, ergo sum. You know? And so that's a philosophy joke. It's a way homer. Um, and so I, as I'm running though, like I just was like, you know, I got to finish this. I'll take one more step. And I finished. And in, in doubt, when we face doubt, sometimes we, we look way down the road and say, how will we ever get there? And Jesus is saying, let me worry about that. I've got this step here for you. Just take that step. Just take the next step. And Jesus' response to Nathaniel is, I saw you under a tree. That's the step you need to believe that I, I saw you under the tree. And he's like, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Like, whoa. And Jesus' response is like, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> You believe because I told you, I saw you under a tree, but just buckle up, baby, because you're going to see some amazing stuff. But right now, just believe that I saw you under the tree because the heavens are going to open and you're going to see angels ascending, descending. You're going to see amazing things, but you just need to believe in those moments of doubt that I saw you under the tree. In your moments of doubt, we, I need to believe that Jesus sees me in my doubt and that Jesus is bigger than my doubt and that Jesus knows my doubts. Jesus knows your doubts and he will give you the faith for that next step to continue following him. And here's the great thing about faith. Faith overcomes doubt. You will never have all the answers to all your questions, ever. And when you die, like people say, like when you, go, when you die, what, what are you going to ask God? I'm not going to ask God anything because I don't care anymore. Like it's like, hey, here I am with God. Like all of these questions that I have, like don't matter because I'm with God. But right now, I just need faith for that next step. And maybe today you're one of the, you're doubting. Maybe you're not following Jesus yet because of doubt. Nathaniel was honored because in him, there was no deceit. Nathaniel expressed his doubts and Jesus honored him for it. So often we feel like we need to hold our doubt in, but the truth is we need to let our doubt out because Jesus is not afraid of your doubt and he's not afraid of your questions and neither should we be afraid of our doubt or our questions. And in your groups, you should be willing to have these questions and say like, I, I don't know how this scripture really works and how to apply this to my life and it's hard and it's challenging and I don't know and be willing to work it out in your group. If you have doubts, ask your questions. And there might be times where you might ask me a question and I will say to you unapologetically, I don't know. Because I gave up trying to know everything a long time ago. And man, is that a relief. Because I know, like John the baptizer, my job is to point people to Jesus. That's your job too. If you're a follower of Jesus, you point people to Jesus. You don't have all the answers. All of these disciples, when they brought people, they said, hey, we found Jesus. That's all they knew. We found Jesus. But they kept bringing people anyway. If you're doubting today, I would love to hear your questions and I would love for you to be, like, make Creekside a place where you can come and ask questions. Because your questions are good. Your questions are valid. There are no wrong questions. But if you're doubting, you gotta let it out. Let your doubt out. So on your Discover card, I asked you to write down uh, disciple and then one, two, three, four. So we're gonna look at those four categories and we're gonna say like, which are you? 
So first one is transferred. If you, are, if you transferred here to Creekside from another church, can you just mark that you did that? And then my question for you is this. How are you following Jesus here? How are you serving the mission of Jesus here? And if you circled that and you're like, oh man, I, I'm not serving anywhere. Then can I challenge you with this next thing? Can you just write ministry team? Because you need to serve. I need to serve. We all need to be serving somewhere. And we would love to get you connected with a ministry team. So if that's you, just write ministry team right there. Like, I'm not serving, I need to be. And just write ministry team. The second group is disciples who are brought. Somebody brought you here to Creekside. That's awesome. We're glad to have you here. Maybe today you're here for the first time because somebody brought you. The first thing I want to encourage you to do is say yes to Jesus. If you are not yet following Jesus, I want to encourage you today, say yes to Jesus. And let us know on your card, just become a follower of Jesus Christ. But if you were brought here, it's because Jesus knew your friend's network and you're in that network and he's drawing you to him and Jesus knows your network too. So I wanna challenge you, who are three people that you, you wanna begin praying for to bring them to Jesus, to point them to Jesus? And can you just write first names there? If that's you, you were brought and you wanna bring. The third one, is disciples who respond. If you just were driving by one day and just said, you know what, I need something, I'll go in there. If that's your story, if you just came in here, what seemed like by chance, I would love to hear your story because I don't believe that, you know, there's any coincidences. I believe Jesus is drawing you here. And if you're here today for the first time, I'm gonna tell you what I told the people in group two. You need Jesus. Say yes to Jesus today. But if you're responding to Jesus in that way as well, I wanna challenge you to tell your story. Tell your story. Because there are people in your life who have no connection with churches too. And when you tell your story, like this is what Jesus did in my life, they can't refute your story because it happened to you and it's happening to you. So if that's you, let, me, let us know on your card. And then the fourth one is doubt. Doubt. Do you have doubts today? It's okay to have doubts. You don't have to have all the questions answered. But if that's you today, I wanna pray for you. I would love to hear your questions. You can, all my contact info is on the website. You can send me your questions and I would love to have those dialogues. But if that's you today, just say, you know what? There are times where I doubt and write it on your Discover card. I want to pray that that the Spirit of God helps you in your doubt to take one more step in following Jesus. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, but I know Jesus will meet me there. And as a follower of Jesus, that's all the confidence I need. I know Jesus is, is ahead of me, drawing me to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son Thank you for rescuing us from from our sin, from our doubt, from our distractions, from all the things that will try to pull us from following you. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray as we try to be disciples who honor you in all of our lives, God, I pray that you would help us to just trust you for that next step. Help us to share the good news with the people in our network. Help us to tell the story of what you've done in our lives. Help us to serve so that we take our eyes off of ourselves, and onto the people that you love, that need Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your church. Thank you, Jesus, for letting us be a part of it. We want to honor you and glorify you in all things. Amen.